Hi, I'm Sandy Peterson, and we are at last going to talk about the long-awaited Windwalker faction. Okay, Windwalker starts on one of two places on the map. He can begin with a gate and six cultists either in the Arctic Ocean or in Antarctica. His choice. Um, so that's kind of a unique uh, ability of his. So, the faction ability is called Hibernate, and what it is is that, is that whenever they want in the game, they can say, I'm going to hibernate now, this is an action that costs zero, and then they take no more actions for the rest of that action phase. They're done, as if they were down to zero power. At the moment they hibernate, they gain power equal to the number of enemy great old ones on the map. So, for example, if there was two enemy great old ones, and you're, you were at four, you'd move up two spaces to six, then you'd hibernate. Uh, my sons like to put your marker on the side to indicate that you're hibernating so you don't forget, but I don't think you forget anyway. So, now the advantage of hibernating is that when the next gather power phase begins, you start with this power added on to yours. It doesn't drop to zero. So you begin at six, then you add on whatever power you earned that phase. So you can potentially have a lot of power in a turn. It kind of goes in pulses every other turn because you usually have a big turn and then you, you hibernate again for the next big turn. So Wendigo has 16 units. They, start, they have six cultists like everyone. Their color is a little off-white. You can see the cultists there. They have four Wendigos. The Wendigos have a uh, nominal cost of one and a combat power of one. They also have four Nafkes. These are their powerhouses. The Nafkes combat is three, which is really good, and their cost is equal to the number of Nafkes you have in your pool off the map. So, for example, the first Nafke you build costs four, because there's four in your pool. But the second Nafke only costs three, because now there's three in your pool, and so forth down. So when you're building your last Nafke, it only costs one. And then if it's lost, it only is one point to rebuild. And since they're a three-point monster, that's pretty good. Uh, in effect, you pay a total of uh, ten power for all four Nafkes, which are three-point monsters, so they're actually a pretty good bargain. Um... Next we have Ron Tagoth. Uh, Ron Tagoth is a great old one. Uh, to summon Ron Tagoth, all you have to do is pay uh, his cost, which is six, and place him either in the Arctic Ocean or the Antarctic. And it doesn't have to have a gate or anything, you just like plop him down there. So remember I mentioned earlier that you can choose whether you want to start in the Arctic or Antarctic? Well, say you start in the, in the Arctic. Well, you can still summon Ron Tagoth in the Antarctic. He has two choices. Even if there's enemy units there or any other thing, you just pay your six and plop them down. That's Ron Tagoth. Ron Tagoth has the special ability of Eternal. What this means is that if he is pained or killed in combat, you may immediately spend one power to cancel that pain or kill. So he's hard to get rid of. One of the reasons that you actually hibernate is to have a little store of, uh, of power that you can use to negate effects on Ron to Goth. Of course, you can choose to accept the pain or the kill, you just don't have to. Um, his leading Great Old One is uh, 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 Ithaqua. Ithaqua also costs six, just like Ron to Goth. Now, to summon Ithaqua, there's some requirements. First, Ron to Goth must have been summoned at least once. He doesn't have to still be in play, but you must have summoned him. And you can tell if you've summoned him, because if you've done it, you've got the spell book for Awakening Ron to Goth, so you know you summoned him. Uh, in case your memory is really short or you have a long break between games. The second requirement is there has to be a gate on the area where you're summoning them, and it has to be, again, in the Arctic or Antarctic, just like with Wander Goth, but this time you have to have a gate. When you summon Ithaca, you pay your six, you place him, and the gate dies. It goes away. Even if it's not your gate with someone else's cultus on it, the gate's destroyed. Now, the cult if there is a cultus on it, the cultist isn't killed, he just, like, the gate just vanishes out from under him, and then, then you have Ithaqua, yay! And you can start making your move. Uh, for various reasons, Ithaqua is not usually seen early in the game. Uh, one of the most relevant reasons, oh, incidentally, uh, sorry to skip this, Ron Tagoth rolls um, three combat dice. It doesn't seem like very many for a great old one, but when you recall that he can't be killed or pained if you don't want him to be, it's kind of bad. Um, now, Ithaqua's combat dice are equal to half the doom points of your opponent. So early in the game, he typically doesn't have that many, that much combat power, but you can't summon him early anyway, since you have to have Ron to Goth first, and then you have to have a gate you're willing to destroy. So he's usually a late game great old one, and so if your enemy has like 19 doom points, then, then uh, Dithiqua has 
rolls 10 dice in battle against him, which is good. Uh, this last unit here on the corner, this is not actually a unit, it's more of a, a marker. This is his Ice Age marker, and we'll get into that in a second. Okay, how you get your spell books for uh, the Windwalker. First, there is... Let's get this out here. Is that visible? Let's, let's pause it and make that visible. Okay, he gets a spell book for Awakening Ron Tagoth. I mean, everyone gets spell books for Awakening the Grilled One. That's one of his Grilled Ones. That gets him a spell book. He also gets a spell book if there is a gate in the other area. For example, if he started in the Arctic Ocean, then he gets a spell book when there's a gate in Antarctica. And if he started in Antarctica, he gets a gate when there he gets a spell book when there's a gate in the Arctic Ocean. He doesn't have to build the gate. It just has to be built by someone. So usually when he's in the game, no one wants to go build gates there because they don't want to help Ithaca. So since, because of that, what Ithaca usually has to Windwalker usually has to do is from a starting location, he has to march south or north to the other area and build his own damn gate. Okay. So, next, he gets a spell book if he is the starting player. Um, he doesn't have a lot of ways of gaining power, so usually the way he, he does this is by having a particularly large hibernate the turn before, and then use that extra power boost to put him up and become first player. He's a late game bloomer. One of the best ways of exemplifying this is that his next spell book, he gets it when another faction has six spell books. So he can never be the first person to get six spell books. He's got to wait for someone else to get it, and then he gets that, that spell book. Occasionally, you'll see people hold off getting their sixth spell book to delay Windwalker getting, getting a spell book, but usually people are too greedy and they want to get their spell book, so it's not that much of a deal. Uh, he has a really interesting spell book, which is he can take this spell book at any time. Just you can just put it and plop it on the map. However, for each enemy player who currently has six spell books, he gets an Elder Sign. So if he waits on getting that until two players have six spell books, he'll get two Elder Signs when he places that spell book. So that's uh, a good thing to... If you, can, if you can afford to wait, it's good. But if you really need the spell book early, you can just get it and not get any Elder Signs. You just like plop it down at the start of the game if you want. The final spell book is for Awakening uh, Ithaca, because you always get one for Awakening your great old ones, and that's one of them. Again, that's usually kind of not an early game one, because... To wake in Ithaca, you have to destroy a gate, and you have to have Ron to Goth, and you have to, uh, you want to have a reasonable amount of combat power, so you want to wait the other guys have a few Doom points. So he's a, a later game unit. Okay, let's talk about the specific spell books he has available. Alright, so this one, Herald of the Outer Gods. What this does is, you pay only five power for your Ritual of Annihilation, regardless of the position of the Ritual Marker. So this is, a, again, another example of the late game uh, powers of Ithaca, because early on, who cares, because the uh, spell, th those, uh, those rituals only cost five or six anyway. But in the late game, you can save quite a bit of power, and you can essentially do a Ritual every turn fairly inexpensively, because it only costs five. Woohoo! So uh, that's what that's for. It's a, okay. Next. He has the cannibalism ability. If there's a battle and one, or, and one or more enemy units are killed in the battle, he can spawn either a cultist or a windigo in the area. Just one, no matter how many guys are killed. That's how it is. Okay, now we're going to show an example. If we can tilt the camera down to the area. Here is a mighty battle. So we got some monsters here. We're gonna fight them with uh, win Ithaca's guys. Hope you can tell help tell the, uh, the evil gray monsters are the bad guys. And we got a star vampire here, and uh, looks like a dimensional shambler, another star vampire. So we're fighting Ithaca here. So this spell book is called Howl. And if you have any Wendigos in an area before the battle, the enemy before you roll dice, the enemy has to retreat one of his guys out of the area to where he wants to go. So in this case, he would probably retreat the uh, the dimensional shambler, but he might retreat a star vampire if he thought they were going to be killed. So before battle, the enemy says, "I'm going to retreat the star vampire." He retreats into Europe or wherever, and then you go on with the battle. Even if I had more Wendigos, I could still only get him to retreat one person. And then, of course, uh, w when the battle happens, 
if you uh, one of your units is killed, and, and you, say you kill the Dimensional Shambler, and, you, and he kills one of your guys, so you kill your Wendigo, well, if you have the Cannibalism ability, you can immediately respawn that Wendigo, because you spawn a unit whenever you have a guy killed in battle, so that's kind of cool. Okay, next, the Nofk has a special ability. Their ability is that for each Nofka killed in a battle, the enemy must kill one additional unit. So, now Nofkas early in the game are expensive, so it's not such a useful ability, but late in the game, when Nofkas are only one or two points, it can be very valuable. For example, say that you were in this fight here, and, the, and, and you killed, um, you rolled zero kills on the enemy, and they rolled uh, a ki one kill on you. So you could say, well, I think I will kill this Nofka for my death, and that means you get an extra kill, and so he kills a star vampire or whatever. And then, because you killed a person, you have cannibalism, so you spawn a Wendigo to replace your Nafka. The next turn you summon your Nafka, and it's all good. So that's an example of how these things can chain together. If you are trying to kill someone really important, like, say, Haster, you can kill off <coughs> several Nafkas, assuming you receive that many kills, in order to take out the, uh, the enemy god. Well, maybe Haster is a bad example, but the Nyarlathotep, say. Okay, there's actually no specific spellbook for Ron Tagoth. Um, it's, we think it's cool enough that he can't be killed, that he can summon him super easily and early, and that he's necessary to get Windwalker out. Windwalker, however, does have a pretty neat special ability. And what it is, it's called Arctic Wind. When Ithaqua moves, you can move any or all friendly units with him. So for example, Ithaca can move from here to the North Atlantic, he can take all these guys along with him. Or he can choose to leave one behind because he wants to leave one behind. So in the late game, what usually happens, Ithaca has this big army of destruction, several Nafkaz, you know, uh, cultists, what, often Rontagoth is in the on the team with him, and he moves around, <coughs> destroying enemies at areas, capturing the gates, and then moves on, leaving behind a uh, occultist uh, on the gate. Speaking of which, I'm now going to make reference to Ithaca's unique ability, which I didn't reference earlier, but that's okay because this is a good time to mention it. It's called Ferox. When Ithaca was in play, your cultists can't be captured by enemy monsters. They can only be captured by great old ones. What this means is, is that when you leave your little stream of cultists behind on the gates, they can't be captured. Well, I mean, that's what I just said, right? That means that you, that you can kind of safely leave them alone, unlike everyone else's uh, cultists. So, to get rid of your, of your cultists, they have to actually go and fight you, which is a pain. All right, uh, finally, we have the Ice Age ability. This helps uh, pin down and immobilize your enemies in, in preparation to be destroyed by you as Ithaca. And what it does is, you pay, it's an action. You pay one power, and you place the Ice Age anywhere on the map. Okay, any actions that are taken affecting that area cost that player an extra point of power. So, for example, if he wants to declare combat on you here, instead of costing one, it costs two. If he wants to move a unit from here into here to join the combat, instead of costing one, it costs two. All actions that affect that area cost more. Uh, so... Even actions that would normally cost zero, now they cost one because of the Dread Ice Age. So you can use that to really kind of hamper a person. He, if he summons a cultist, it costs him an extra point. If he summons a monster, it's just, it's just a pain to have Ice Age there. So the Ice Age can be used in two ways. One, to hinder a person from doing things in general. A, a, another is to sort of get people out of the area that you're moving to so that you can get there safely and they can't really defend or fight over it. Um, oh, if you are, if you have an ice age in an area where they have units and they're leaving the area, technically that doesn't affect the area they're in, it affects where they go to, so it doesn't cost them extra power to move out, only to move in or to avatar there or stuff like that. What if you move multiple units into the ice age area? So if you move multiple units in the ice age area, it costs plus one total. So if I move three guys in, it would cost me four instead of, not six, because it's one action, so it's one extra move. So you can kind of bull your way through Ice Age with enough power, but it's there's the Ice Age tax that makes things sucky, so that's how that works. Okay, 
That is Ithaca, a late game powerhouse with his huge army of doom. He's the only guy that can really stand up to Cthulhu's wrecking crew when he gets his big army together and goes around doing things. And what he tends to do in the game is have uh, one really big turn in a late game where he takes his army, moves across the map, capturing a whole bunch of gates, and he has like five or six gates all at once. And then he has one huge scoring turn, and then uh, either that wins him the game or else, you know, it doesn't. But that's sort of his play. Okay, thank you for listening to me. And now I hope you know a little bit more about the Windwalker.